for joining today's Accelerate Your Performance podcast. And thank you for having a desire to be your best at work and helping your organization achieve success. This podcast focuses on tactical actions to improve workplace culture. And these tactics align to our nine principles for organizational excellence. I'm pleased to have Dr. Natalie Harder join our show again today. Dr. Harder is the Chancellor of South Louisiana Community College, SLCC, one of our premier organizational partners. We last heard from Natalie on episode number 53 when we discussed building strong leadership teams. As the world began to experience the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Harder and the SLCC team were able to make the necessary shifts to support students and staff in a highly productive and efficient way. Hearing the actions that were taken at SLCC filled me with pride. I'm so proud to be connected to one of the best leaders you'll meet. And over the next several weeks, I'll be interviewing leaders at organizations who showed great leadership in a time when we were all experienced a tremendous crisis in our country and in the world. As we begin to show the show today, I've I want to I want to reach out and thank our healthcare workers for their dedication to help people in greatest need. They are the heroes of the world. We are so grateful to you. Dr. Harder, welcome back to our show. It's so great to have you with us. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, let's start today with uh, first question. And I know your leadership team supported SLCC to make a transition from the current state of working to working virtually like we all have across the country. And I know you're extremely proud of the transition work by your team. Can you walk, walk us through the processes your team applied to, to make this a successful launch? Yeah, and I, I really appreciate um, the acknowledgement that, um, that you've just given that team. You know, uh, you mentioned it in your opening remarks, Janet, and, and I think as I'm very fortunate that I have a group of individuals that are always forward thinking. And, you know, uh, we were all cognizant of sort of what was coming out of China. I mean, we had even had a, a couple of conversations about potential impacts, you know, I don't want to say, you know, at least weeks and weeks ago, but I don't think we had envisioned uh, or at least consciously envisioned what that might have meant in terms of change for the organization. But as it became clear that that the U.S. would be significantly impacted, you know, the my team just kicked it into high gear. You know, we were, I think, talking sort of immediate and and a little bit ahead, but at the same time, they were thinking, and we were we were strategizing or sharing articles a little bit about, you know, what would be the near term, right? So not long term yet, but how do we get through today? How do we get through the rest of the week? And then what happens next week? And then the week after that. So as we started to see what was happening in higher education on the West Coast in California, Oregon, and Washington, we were putting on to paper plans for, um, for execution with respect to business continuity and instructional continuity. You know, you never know if you're gonna to have to pull the trigger, but at, at, at an executive level, and then even into those, the direct reports for the executive team, we're starting to have conversations and going back and forth about what it would mean if we had to move, quite frankly, instruction uh, and, and training online. So I just think it, it's, it, and it's the nature of, of SLCC's executive team to, to, to always be thinking beyond what we're doing immediately. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting as our team too has had to make the transition from being on the road and connecting with people, you know, face to face to building that virtual connection and building structure around our team. And it's interesting what you said, we're focusing, looking at it long at the long term, but we're able to focus on it in the short term so that we can make those decisions because that's at least you start making decisions and getting movement and it's the short term that allows us to do that is that right you... oh, oh totally totally because if you can't get yourself out of whatever is the immediate you know crisis or or fire heat you can't think clearly about 
how to move forward. And, and I'll tell you the way that that exemplified itself was we literally in 48 hours had 95% of our courses being taught remotely, ready mm, to go. That's incredible. When you look at schools that you could say are much have much larger budgets or maybe smaller number of students, however you want to define those, the fact that that our folks were able to do it in 48 hours is unbelievable. Yeah, now, yeah. was it perfect? Absolutely not. You know, there were technology issues, but but more, I want to say this, Jen, it wasn't so much that the issues were around, you know, deploying thing that uh, their intentions, it was, oh my gosh, my WebEx won't work, right? Or there's a bandwidth issue. It was things outside of our control. The, I mean, if, I mean, I've, I've said it a number of times, but if I could send a cake to every employee, I would do it yeah. because their ability to do that. And now at the same time, you have to imagine on the op side, uh, we are going through, how do we get everybody to work remotely? So HR and payroll and all those types of things, I'm like, get home, figure out how to do. So it's not like, you, you know, you could just walk down the hall and ask a question or even call another office. You had to engage differently. So, so you know, there was a, it's funny because I would say that both sides of the house were having those challenges at the same time maybe they could respect what they were all going through but but you know we turned around almost 90 percent of our folks working remotely in 24 hours mm -hmm. so i mean it was just an outstanding it, it was an outstanding effort but the but the beauty of it comes from like like the executive team was this is non-negotiable there's no gray here you don't get to you know, hang out for a little bit, then maybe go home. No, it was like, our job is to keep you safe. Do not come to the office or, or there could be consequences for that. So, so the fact that, that that team, and then you know how that cascades down, cascades down was so intent on making sure their people stayed safe that, I mean, it, these were just a set of marching orders that there's no discussion here. Yeah. Uh, so that and was kept us very focused. Yeah, that's great. And, uh, you know, just as you're talking about your executive team and then the cascading to, to leaders and then I'm sure to your employees, you know, how did people come together during the transition time? What did the, pe what did the people interaction look like? Yeah. Well, as I'm sure with you a little bit, it was nonstop, right? It was, it was, adjusting to well i've never used this type of technology before but i but oh guess what H, it sent two emails about how to use microsoft teams right i know i can go back and do that and for our leaders like there was no that we just moved right into it right like guess what i got to talk to you and so i needed to be on this webex so I, you know, I think leadership modeled it, but there was no excuse not to be engaged like we were always engaged. Um, you know, we had leaders sending out hints about how to work at home, you know, wake up, take a shower, just like you were going to work regularly, schedule your meetings and things like that. So, you know, I think they were, they were very on top of it. I, I have always been a, pro a proponent of telecommuting. I did it 22 years ago in New York. Uh -huh. When my first born came around. So I've just, and, and given that we have nine campuses, 6,200 square miles, I think people work remotely all the time. Yeah. But, but, you know, we have such a relationship culture in, in our state and in our community, you know, it just wasn't something I think people felt comfortable with. Now, what I have, what I have asked is no questions, at least once a week, I want you to see your teams. I don't yeah. think how I, you know, virtual or te through technology, because I think that was key to us being able to trust each other as we moved forward. I had sent an email out to my leaders saying, as we go to do this, 98% of our people are going to be awesome and 2% are going to take advantage of it. The 98% who are going to do it right, they're the ones who deserve your attention. Do not worry about the other people who are going to try and figure out how to make this a stay at home vacation. Our students don't have time for us to worry about that. So I think that that gave them some freedom to not feel like they had to document everything. It was just trying to move forward by, by doing the right thing. 
Yeah, that's and you've built that culture to where you know you have the 98% who are going to do the right thing. And, you know, that helps helps a lot. So you're not you're always going to have that two to three percent, but you're right. This isn't the time. This isn't the time to address them. This is the time to really wrap your arms around the people who are going to really transition and do the best work. So as as you're as you look out and at the employees and faculty and staff and your leaders, how were you able to serve your students? How did how were you able to make that transition that quickly? Yeah. Well, I think that that we, you know, we laid, technically, we sort of laid out for them a number of different options, right? How to engage with your students. How do you do video chat? How do you use our learning management system? You know, uh, you know how is, what pieces have to be online in order for students to be successful? You know, our, our academic folks also sent the message that, look, this is not the time for um, layer upon layer of reinforcement around learning outcomes. In other words, if you have four assignments to help drill home a learning outcome, can you get to two, right? And so gotcha. how is it that you are serving students? And, and in many cases, you know, how can we serve them faster? Because Janet, by that I mean is we don't know how this thing is going to ramp up. Assume that you as a faculty member get sick you don't want your student, I mean, in a face-to-face -face situation, someone could walk in and teach your class, but now how is it that you serve students so they complete that course even while you're sick? So I am at an adjunct at SLCC. So in my case, I opened up all my assignments, all my quizzes, everything. So if a student can do it in two weeks, do it in two weeks. Yeah. You may be looking to work double shifts after that or some, you know, who knows the disruptions that people are going to have in their lives. So let's kind of get over what we might have thought was, you know, sort of lockstep and you've got to do this triangulation around this piece. What, what is the minimum we can approach from a learning outcomes perspective? Don't lose the rigor. Make sure your students have what they need to, to move beyond your course successfully, but pare it back as much as possible. So I think that freedom you know, I think faculty have never taught, yeah. for example, remotely were at first a bit overwhelmed. And, and I'm sure regardless of what we would have said, they felt overwhelmed. But it was like, you know, take a bite, you know, small bite at a time and just do what you can. But also think about pairing back. Think about relaxing what have always been these strict guidelines for you. Just like we are trusting you, your 98% of your students are going to be honest and do the work. You cannot worry about the other 2% right now. Yeah. Well, great. I mean, great advice, great leadership, Natalie, because that's, and the innovation that's going to come out of this, you know, the ideas, I can't wait, you know, when this is over and we get a chance to talk and reflect on what did we do, what worked and what did we learn for it? Wow. It's going to be tremendous value to us because we wouldn't normally, the things we're doing, the same thing with us, we would normally do some of the things we're doing, but we're having to do those. And man, I think we're going to be better, you know, better I, for them. <laughs> I can't agree with you more, Janet. And just one last thing is, I, I honestly don't know if we could have done this as well if we didn't have some foundational pieces for us to go back to. For example, every night I send a check-in to all of my employees and I'm always referencing our core values, our pillars, our everyday excellence, you know, what we call our, our studer effort so that, you know, we can continue to be grounded back into that. The rounding that we have done, particularly in the last year, meant that folks built relationships and trusted each other so that I, I don't know what's going to happen in this division, but I know those people now and I, and I think they're going to kill it. So I, if we did not have some of those common pieces, those common language, common behavior, I'm not sure that we would have been able to do it as well as we did it as quick. I don't know, I'm, I'm sure we wouldn't because people would have had different focuses, right? So when I can reference, you know, somewhere where folks have innovate have been innovative to take care of one another I, you know I, in my checking in i i reference the fact that that was is the our pillar about people right or when i see right. something innovative i say that wow and i say that's it wow that's our core val one of our core values is innovation so i keep keep trying to remind people that, that that really is our base. And I think it's extremely helpful. You don't have to pick words out of the air to describe what we're doing. 
those keywords at key times. Yes. You know, people remember that's exactly, you know, part of the cadence, part of our hardwiring in terms of excellence. Yeah, I think it's, you know, the notes that we've gotten are things like we're really able to pull those tools out of our toolbox now. And sometimes I'll hear, you know, when, the, when people are trying to, to build the keywords at key times and communicate, they're thinking, you know, what would I say? What would I tell them? How would I coach them? And, um, you know, it's been really rewarding for me just to think that we've been able to have that relationship and communicate in that way where, where that, those tools are supportive and that work is, is really helpful. So, you know, just appreciate that. Appreciate, the, appreciate you and, and the leadership that you've provided to your team and really fallen back on the things that are most successful to them. So as we close today, um, Natalie, you know, what, what advice would you leave us and leave your colleagues across the nation as we're all making this transition and working through the work that we do every day with our employees in, a, in an environment that's different for us, but also just taking care of people as we're making this transition? So what I have settled on, um, as you know, Janet, over the last two years or so, is that it's about your team. There is no time when weak members of your team would be more apparent to you than they are now. And by and you have got to deal with those folks because you are letting everybody else down. That is your 2%, your 5%, whatever the number is, you have to move them on because my guess is both you and the people around these people have had to do additional work while we're all doing 80 hours a week because you allow those weak people to stay. So please don't do that to yourself and to your team or, and your whoever it is you serve going forward anymore. It, it just cannot, it's not okay. Secondly, I would say, you know, if you haven't found the, the actions, the, the, the terms that you live by as an organization, you, you've got to do that because it makes it so much more relevant as a leader to be able to talk to your organization, your division, your department, your unit in those in that common language, those key terms at, in times of crisis, hysteria, of, of the unknown, because everybody understands exactly what those terms mean and it can help settle things. So, so, you know, applaud those people that have been outstanding, which is probably almost all of your team deal immediately with those folks who, who couldn't cut it. Do not excuse the situation because we're all in this same situation. Uh, and then if you haven't gotten yourself grounded in a foundation of, of service actions and service terms, you know, get those under your belt because who knows what's coming next. Yeah, thank you. Great advice and just really appreciate your time today. The, the work that you all are doing and the transition that you've made has been incredible. I, I can just see the people on your team, you know, coming together, really working, wrapping their arms around each other and, and uh, taking this very serious and really servicing your students and each other in the most meaningful way. So thank you and extend my appreciation to the SLCC team for the great for the great work. Thank you for being with us today, Natalie. Well, I certainly appreciate it, Janet, and you know how I feel that we would not be here without your coaching, without your team support. So um, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So to our listeners, as we leave today, you know, think about some of the things that Natalie talk to us about in terms of actions that you could take. There are a couple that I know that you can do three things that I think you can do tomorrow. You know, one is small steps, you know, take, find something you can do and take some small steps and work with your team on those small steps. Number two, really begin to build it back to the values. Look at the values and choose a value in your organization and connect back to one of those values and build your language and the why of what you're doing back to those values. And then three, you know, just really build probably more structure and more touch points. That's one thing I've found is this is not fewer touch points. This is more touch points. And I think I heard that throughout Natalie's conversation today. So three quick tips for those of you who are making this transition with the people that you work with. So before we go, I want to let you know that at this time, we're still planning to host our annual What's Right in Education Leadership Conference on July 28th and 29th. 
as part of that conference. We hope we'll be at a place where we're reflecting on what we've learned, as I talked about with Natalie today, and, and as we reflected on what we've learned during this transition. Equally important, we want to create an opportunity for people to network and be with each other for learning and fun, which is what we always do at all of our conferences. You can find updates, featured speakers, and more about what's right in education on studereducation.com slash events. So please join us and your colleagues at that event, and we'll keep our fingers crossed that we'll be able to be with each other. So thank you for tuning in to Accelerate Your Performance. Please share the podcast and make sure you're subscribed for new episodes. I look forward to connecting with you next week as we continue to focus on the nine principles for organizational excellence so that we can be our best at work. Have a great week.